News Talk On Demand. Interruption-free audio where you want it, when you want it. Gary Nickel, you are an absolutely love in love with this thing. I just Without love growing pains. That's all there is to it. And Eric knows I've been pumping this all day on the Twitter machine at Gary King Nickel, just so you know. Take it away, Drew. Eric Macromella from Offside of Sports Law Blog and then the host of Offside, the business and law of sports joins us. It's always great to talk to Eric. Eric, uh, Gary's a huge fan now of that. Well, he's always a huge fan, but that, that's, that solidified it for us. It is uh, it is a great song. It is a, a moving song, and it is a transformational song, guys. It, uh, it's definitely a game changer. <laughs> yeah, I was I was listening to you guys talk at, at at the top of the hour about how you were talking to uh, Denis Potvin, and yeah. you know, occasionally here they have me fill in on the morning show or the afternoon show, and I had the opportunity to interview to uh, interview him, and I have to say he is one of the more eloquent. And well-spoken guys out there, uh, in and out of hockey. And I know when he played for the Islanders, you know, as their captain, he was kind of in charge of the media. Basically, they went to him first, and I could see why. He's so well-spoken, isn't he? And he's and he's always got that that little twinkle in his voice behind. You know, he's got the smile going all the time. Every time you see him, he's he's always upbeat and positive. And you know, he only had one injury in his entire NHL career. It was with his thumb. That that all of the years that he played and the way he played, he just had a thumb injury uh, a little later on in his career that that caused him problems. That was it. And, you know, he, 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 he's the kind of guy that I, I don't say. So, People don't forget about him because obviously he's in the Hall of Fame, but he really was sort of a transformational kind of defenseman. And other guys that got a lot more points or a lot more flashy seem to get more attention in retrospect. But really, I mean, as far as defensemen go, he's a, he has to be you know in your top five of all time. He was Absolutely. just a new breed of defenseman. Just dominant. He was so he was so tough to play against. Unbelievable. Um, a few things I want to get to today. First off, Taylor Hall gets injured. Okay, with that that warm up, and he's not wearing a helmet. As an owner, can I force my player to wear helmets in in the warm up? Can I force them to protect themselves? You can um, adopt a policy, a team policy. Um, making players wear their helmets. And the Rangers, I believe, do that. Rangers, I think if you watch them the pregame skate, they're all wearing helmets. So from that perspective, yes. I think the issue you're raising is an interesting one, is at what point do you have to get the the consent of the NHLPA for right. something, for example, like mandatory mm-hmm. visors? And in, in a case like, you would have to get the NHLPA consent in situations where it would be a league-mandated change, something right across. But if it's the team imposing it... And and it's not really affecting the conditions of employment. And that term is actually in the CBA, the conditions of employment. And that also applied to the realignment uh, situation slash fiasco that we saw earlier this we'll month. So, so if, if, if it doesn't affect the conditions of employment, I think you would agree that having players wear their helmets in the pregame really doesn't affect their conditions of employment then the teams can do it. And uh, personally, you know, as as a lawyer, I, I would prefer to see that because it seems like, for me, uh, the players not wearing their helmets in the pregame with plucks, with pucks, excuse me, flying around, um, that, that creates an unnecessary risk, I think. I know players want to show off, you know, the hair kind right. of flowing, and there's the, when you put the helmet on, I think you lose a little bit of your individuality, and I understand that. And this is, this is the opportunity for them to brand themselves, really, you know? Uh, yeah. But I think ultimately you need to be safe on something like this and have players wear helmets. It's just common sense. And there's you, you're going to two places I already want to I want to get to. Of course, the NHLPA rejection, but I wanted to tag it the Taylor Hall discussion with this. Apparently, a neighbor of Joe Flacco, NFL quarterback, the playing for plays for Baltimore, phoned the Baltimore Ravens because Joe Flacco was in his own driveway on a skateboard and they were saying hey this guy's on a skateboard and don't you know we're trying to win a Super Bowl I, I'm going to make a huge a huge gigantic leap here but if I'm an owner of a team and I'm not saying you can't be on a, super, a, a skateboard before your AFC championship game but how much control can a team have over a contracted uh, player well, first thing, I think Joe Flacco on his skateboard in the game might actually help him. If Joe Flacco <laughs> completes more than 12 passes this weekend, I'm going to buy both of you a car. Uh, <laughs> the generally way it works is 
when the player signs a contract, there are activities that are prohibited or sort of similarly situated activities, ones that are as dangerous but can't be named because you can't name everything. So, for example, players can't go skydiving, for example. Uh, but there are also lesser uh, types of activities. And the language in the contract is going to be broad enough that you can always make an arguable case that if Joe Flacco got hurt while skateboarding in his driveway, um, that he's, for example, is not entitled to be paid from that point onwards because he was engaged in activity that he shouldn't have. Uh, in a case like that, that, that specific skateboarding uh, case, my expectation is the team would put pressure on him to put his skateboard away, perhaps give it to his son, who's nine years old or however <laughs> old he is, and let, let him use his skateboard and have him focus on trying to complete a pass during a game. <laughs> Well said. Eric Macromella, our guest from Offside and Sports Law Blog. Um, let's stay with the NFL for a second. Uh, another suit has been filed today, which is now third suit. Um, but in, in this suit, the former the seven retired players charged that the NFL used fraud and negligence uh, in, in, in publishing non-scientific papers written by biased members of its medical committee. Is that different in the in the argument that the the other two lawsuits are saying that they were responsible for our our condition now the fraud seems like a new, it's a new word to me in what the uh, the ex players are charging that's a that's a really interesting question and it hasn't been publicized but we're actually up to almost a dozen lawsuits now there was wow. the first one in california there was the class action that was launched in Philly uh, with Jim McMahon, the former quarterback of the Bears, who could complete a pass, by the way. He was sort of the central figure <laughs> in that lawsuit. But there have been other lawsuits. But what we're seeing now in these subsequent lawsuits is the players are kind of aiming a little bit lower. What they, what they alleged in the first couple lawsuits was that there was fraud, that the NFL knew that um, this type of contact was a problem, and, but they concealed that information from the players. But now what the players are alleging is they're saying they either knew or they ought to have known. And ought to have known is lowering the bar makes it, in theory, easier for the players. Not an easy case to make out, but easier a case to try and argue. Say, look, maybe they didn't have the information. Maybe they didn't have the science. But come on. They ought to have known that this type of, uh, of contact or collision will have an adverse permanent impact on uh you know on the brain but, but that and, becomes a tough case because then you can argue well the players should have known as well right you're kind of right. making a common sense argument so that, that, that's exactly what i'm going to say i'm going to say okay well in in my simple way i would say well wait a second then that is just like you said you guys should have known as well but even if you didn't know there wasn't really anybody forcing you to go back on the field did did anybody from the nfl offices or did your head coach or anybody say you have to go back out there or you lose your job and and you and i both know how sports work it's kind of a nudge nudge wink wink but it's not you have to go back out or you're not you're not going to play again yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are a number of arguments you can make. You're, you're right about, about that, is that, you know, players, let's say they knew, but they still decided to go out there. And this ties into something we have talked about before, Drew, in other contexts, and this this legal principle of voluntary assumption of risk or just consent. When a hockey player steps on the ice or a football player steps on the field, when your toe hits that playing field, it's like you're signing this waiver saying, look, I understand that I am now playing a, a contact or a collision game, and I consent that contact is incidental to the game. And for football... That includes having your head uh, drilled into the ground. Why does the, the NF? Oh, sorry. Why does the NFL want to consolidate all the cases? Is that because it, it's a lower cost for them, or is it because it makes it easier to to fight against one big entity where I don't have to go? And really have a face on every single lawsuit that's filed to me. It, you know, it's it's easier for a defendant if they're faced with multiple lawsuits. And as I said, now you know we're yeah. now in the in the double digits to consolidate them into one lawsuit and deal with them all at once. But there's sort of it's it's not even it's not that simple in any event because you're still dealing with individual claimants. Now these individual claimants have to have the court certify their class. That means if it's a class action lawsuit, McMahon and all the rest of the players have to go to the court and say, "Look, we want you to make this a class action lawsuit because we have A, B, C, D in common. We all played. All the all the allegations are the same. So even that is not easy. But I suspect that that would happen for the NFL. It it's a management issue and it's 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 a monetary damages issue. You you want. 
in law, you always want to try and consolidate because it's cleaner, right? I mean, would you rather buy your groceries at five different grocery stores or just focus on one? I think you want to go to the one. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Mind and, you, you know, there's the kids... one more interesting point, and I'm sorry for, for interrupting you. No, this go is ahead. a point that I've raised a few times uh, on the show, and that is that one other problem for these players, and this also ties in to what happened in, in, in the summer with Derek Bugard and the other two uh, players that, that unfortunately passed away, and that's issue of causation. Even if you want to sue the NFL, even if you want to sue the NHL, you still have to show that the NHL or the NFL is responsible for your result or your outcome. And if you're a fighter in hockey, for example, and you've had 174 fights like Bugard had or whatever the number was, you haven't been fighting only in the NHL. You've been fighting in, in junior and in the minors. So how do you stop, establish the NHL caused this? That's really tough to do. So causation is a major hurdle for these players who play football in college and in high school. So when did the damage occur and who caused it? Yeah, see, I think they're, I think they're, especially going up against the juggernaut that is the NFL. I think they're an uphill battle. I'm, as usual, we're running out of time, but I want to ask about the your, a great blog on, on, uh, or a great article on, on your blog, Offside Sports Law blog, about the NHLPA rejection of the realignment. Um, just from your standpoint as a lawyer and, of course, as a sports guy, the NF, the NHL handled this rather clumsily, didn't they? It, it, it was interesting. I mean, generally, I think when you're involved in this kind of adjustment to your business model, let's just call it that, you're, I think you're going to want to get assurances behind the scenes before you go ahead and say that it's a done deal. Now, sometimes you'll say it's a done deal when it's not, like the NFL did with the lockout, to apply pressure on the union. Maybe in this case, that was the idea to apply pressure, but didn't really do that. And the, 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 the problem is, is that on the eve of CBA negotiations right. that have the potential being very contentious with respect to revenue, share is only 57% and will likely drop between 50 and 52. That's contentious. That's a lot of money. Why on earth would the union ever give up any kind of bargaining position? So, you know, in that blog I wrote, people were saying, oh, they were throwing, they were, they, they were, they were sort of, you know, uh, critical of the NHLPA. Why? N- number one, why on earth would, would they ever give up their leverage? How on earth is this a surprise? It, this can't be uh, a, a surprise, and frankly, if you work for the union, you would do the same. And as a lawyer, this is not a tough decision. I'd be sitting at my desk eating a sandwich. The email comes, and I go, "No, forget this." I would hit <laughs> reply, and go, "No consent. Going to buy sandwich, probably tuna. Goodbye." And that's it. And the thing is, this shouldn't be seen as contentious. I understand that that is the perception of the public, but from a legal standpoint, this is just part of the ebbs and flows of negotiations. You're not taking this personally. This is not like a massive, huge deal. And frankly, realignment won't be a big big bargaining chip, but it is a bargaining chip nonetheless, so you have to hang on to it. Eric Macramella, Offside of Sports Law Blog, Offside the Business and Law of Sports Radio Show, sandwich eater and not a Joe Flacco believer. <laughs> Go right wow, yeah. that was a great, that was a great extra. Well, hold on, Drew, I got this from on, on the way All up. right. Oh, my goodness. Turn it down. Eric, as always, man, I love Turn talking. Down, man. I love when you come on. There you go. You, you are the best, my friend. Thank you very much. It's a much. pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, both of you have a great night uh, and uh, have a great show. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. The great Eric Macromella. <laughs> Turn it down. <laughs> Turn my old f- ears. Turn that. Is it, is it, that's, like, why is that so loud? It's, it's, it's the way it is. It's wired up that it's way. It's not right. You, Man, we growing turn Pains that Drew was so awesome that it wasn't meant to be played quietly. Sort of like Metallica. Okay. <laughs> I am, I'm, we have got to have that. When the Patriots destroy oh. <laughs> Joe Flacco and the, and the Ravens, we we're going to our... play, play Eric's, <laughs> Eric's rant. Oh, what's it? We both get new cars? We both get new cars. He's not going to complete 12 passes. There's no way. We'll be back on News Talk Radio. Welcome back to the program. Uh, we've only got about a minute left. Coming up, uh, Kelly McClintock from Hockey Saskatchewan. Is that what it's called? What is it? What I believe is it it's nowadays? called Hockey Saskatchewan still, yes. yes. Yeah, hockey have... Sask. Hockey Sask. they got and... a Twitter feed. It's at Sask underscore hockey. Not are at you, Gary are you King in... Nickel, but. What is that? What's yours again? I, I don't remember what yours is. I believe is. it's at Gary King Nickel. If you want to follow the show <laughs> oh. and all the fun that happens. Me and Eric are actually just talking, sharing Who? pleasantries. Eric Macramella, our sports yes. show lawyer. The great. He's awesome. He's so, he not, he's so he's, he's as best. I said to him, great job as always. Thanks for the hilarity and the new cars for me and Drew. <laughs> and most of all, the growing pains. Take care. <laughs> then he said, always fun, G-Man. Huge fan G-Man. of Eric Macromel. He calls G-Man. me G-Man. G-Man. We're pals. I told you we're pals. 
I love Eric. I think Eric is great. He's, we need him on a lot more, is all I'm saying. Yes, a lot I, more. I agree with you. Um, I didn't have any great questions tonight, though. Usually he goes, that's a good question to me, and I feel yeah, you really didn't blow good his about mind. myself. But we, yeah, we came in knowing there wasn't much out there, but you did great.